So top 10 sins and struggles, this is lesson number 12 in the series. Finishing up the series uh, tonight. Let's do our countdown as we have for the final time. Top sins and struggles according to the surveys. Laziness, anger, cursing and gossiping, number seven, pride. Neglecting church, number six. Tied at number five, coping with change. Coping with conflict. Number four, easily discouraged, not just discouraged, easily discouraged. Number three, over anxious or worry uh, as a struggle. Number two, overly critical. And then number one, I broke it into two, was the lack of personal discipline. And I said that in this last lesson, I would reveal what issue about the lack of personal discipline did people put down. And the issue was overeating. Overeating. Interesting to note that the number one personal discipline issue that pers uh, people noted was food related, not drugs or porn or gambling. And I would hope that that would be the case. You know? I mean, uh, it's not like uh, we did a survey of just people on the street, people who are not members of the church or something like that. But overeating. You know, when you think about it, food, you know, it's a gift from God. Food is a gift from God. Uh, it's an everyday pleasure. And that this gift from God and this everyday pleasure pose the greatest challenge, as far as our little survey is concerned in the church, for our personal discipline. Of course, some people you know, have uh, naturally you know, large frames, others have thyroid issues, others have obesity as a genetic thing in their family, of course. However, the number one sin and struggle that people mention uh, is overeating or un unhealthy eating. So I think in our survey what we're talking about is a bad habit, a bad habit that affects the body and soul as well as as other people. I think that's what we're talking about. Now obviously I'm not qualified to talk about clinical eating disorders. I mean there's such a thing as that. I am not, I cannot address that. I don't have the expertise. But I think that the majority of the people who acknowledge bad eating habits as problems are not dealing with things at this level. I don't think we're talking about in our survey clinical dis uh, eating disorder. I believe uh, simply that um, the people who wrote this down are describing a simple bad habit that is causing them problems in their, every, in their everyday lives. So with this in mind, let's look at this issue, this overeating issue. First of all, from the perspective of habit. Bad eating habits seems to be the term that kept cropping up, bad eating habits. So choosing poor nutrition over good, overeating, using food as a reward or a substitute for something else, this is an ongoing habit, not a good one. Now the word habit, if we're going to talk about habits, comes from a Latin word which means to hold or to live within. So a habit is a way of acting which because of repetition becomes a normal part of our lives. So it's a way of acting, a choice, a decision that we make, a way we choose to act because of repetition just becomes a normal part of our lives. Don't even think about it anymore. Now the problem with bad habits is that they usually produce negative consequences in our lives. Otherwise, I don't think anybody would have put down that that's a problem. For example, people who have you know, anger as a bad habit, they tend to be isolated and lonely because people have learned to avoid them. People have learned not to tell them the truth because telling them bad news or bad things you know, as the truth you know, is going to just, they're going to blow up. People like that are in constant conflict with other people and themselves because of what their anger produces. Harsh words, poor decisions, violent acts. 
So people with the bad habit of just losing their temper all the time, you know, there are consequences that come back from that. Well, in the same way, people with bad eating habits suffer from guilt. And they suffer from guilt continually on an emotional basis and from a host of health problems as a result of their poor eating choices and patterns. These, of course, are the obvious and primary problems that these particular bad habits cause. However, like all bad habits, they also produce other negative effects that always come with the repetition of destructive behavior. So it's not just bad eating habits, but all kinds of bad habits create certain problems for everyone, regardless of the bad habit. For example, feelings of unworthiness, Continually repeating bad habits like, well, outbursts of anger, or eating badly or eating too much make us feel unworthy. And when we feel unworthy, we, we feel that we don't deserve God's love because we're always repeating the same negative thing. I mean, if I don't like me, how can God like me? That's the thinking. I don't like me. I'm fed up with me. I'm tired of me. I can't even imagine why God likes me. I can't even, you know, get, I can't even muster enough love to love me. Why? Well, because I keep doing this thing here. So bad habits have a way of making us not like ourselves and think that others don't like us either, including God. Uh, other things that bad habits produce, feelings of discouragement, you know, bad habits usually lead us to paralysis. We're paralyzed. We begin to feel helpless because we're continually repeating the same mistakes. I can't say no. Or I can only say no once out of every five times. That's a lousy average. After a while, it seems that our habits are stronger than we are. And that's discouraging. Bad habits produce a defensive attitude. You know, we, we invent all kinds of methods to avoid dealing with our bad habits. So what do we do? What kind of strategies? Well, we laugh it off. We tell fat jokes. You know, we'll tell it on ourselves before anyone else will point it out to us. Ah, you, you don't have to laugh at me. I'm going to laugh at me. I'll save you the trouble. <laughs> or we rationalize it. It's not so bad. I've seen bigger guys around than me. <laughs> or we reject those who try to help us by pointing out our bad habit. You know, it's like, don't go there. Let's not talk about food. Let's not talk about health. You know, let's talk about something else. Don't go there. You know, that, that's just a defense mechanism. Or we go into denial. We run away. We deny we have a problem. Or we become apathetic. I don't care, I can't stop. Smokers, you know. Smokers go, yeah, got to die from something. Might as well die from something I like doing. I mean, that's talk about apathy. <laughs> so anything to defend our habit and our right to practice it, to practice our bad habit. Bad habits also produce rebellion. We decide to keep our bad habit even if it makes us feel bad, even if God forbids it, even if our conscience, our health, our family, our friends are negatively affected by it, doesn't matter. We're familiar with our bad habit and the pleasure and power or comfort it brings us outweighs the negative consequences. I go back to the smokers, you know, you know what? I don't care what anybody says. This is, I remember, I remember myself saying this. This is my only pleasure. This is the only thing I like to do. I don't like doing all that other stuff. You know. I like doing this better than I like eating. I remember saying that to somebody. I eat in order to get to the cigarette after the meal. And anybody who's been a smoker here understands exactly what I'm saying. So you know, in the end, we just say, hey, don't even talk to me about it. I'm sticking it out. Now, the strategy to overcome the bad habit 
of poor eating is essentially the same as the strategy to overcome any bad habit. It isn't a particular strategy. The same strategy works for all the habits because all the habits have common, uh, have common denominators. There may be some details you know, that change from situation to situation, but the approach in principle is virtually the same for everything. So how do we break the cycle of bad habits, including poor eating habits? Number one, you got to want to. <laughs> you got to want to. You have to want. The Hebrew writer put it this way, he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, to finish out the phrase. Hebrews 11.6. In other words, you must want to believe for faith to be formed in you. No one can force you to believe. You know, several years ago, a man, not in this congregation, called me about his son. He wanted to know what he could do to make his son give up the homosexual lifestyle. His son you know, came out as gay. This is what he wanted to do. He was tired of hiding it. I'm gay. That's what I'm, this is how I'm going to live. If you don't like it, too bad. You know. And the father was you know, a good Christian man and he called me up and he wanted to talk. And so we talked for a while and in the end I told him that nothing could be done until the young man wanted to come out of this lifestyle until he wanted to come out of this sinful lifestyle, this sinful sexual habit. You couldn't do anything. No amount of preaching or pressure or nagging can make somebody give up a bad habit if they don't want to. Now someone may ask, well, how does a person develop a desire to break a bad habit? Well, there's no common rule here, but from experience, I can share with you some things that motivate a person to want to break a bad habit, whether it's poor food consumption or a bad temper or anything else. So some motivators to help you want to break the habit. Truth. Truth. The biggest problem with homosexuality in this country is that we're no longer allowed to tell the truth about it. We can't say the truth. Now to say the truth about it will get you arrested, will get you sued. You know, some states trying to pass a defense of marriage thing or to protect Christians from not having to, like a church not having to hire a gay minister or so on and so forth. They try to pass that law in Georgia. Did you see what happened? 50 biggest corporations in America said, we'll cut you off, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll tamp you down, we'll ruin you. We won't make movies about you. We'll ridicule you. Exactly what were they trying to do? Well, they were just trying to protect the religious freedom of individuals to be Christians and to practice their faith, to actually say that you believe that a man and a woman, this is God's you know, natural plan for marriage. To say that is now considered, you know, you're prejudiced, you're a homophobe, you're evil. The, 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 the destructive thing about that is that it doesn't permit anyone to stand up and tell the truth about it. When you know the truth about what you are doing and that it is wrong, this may be the spark that gets you going, that makes you want to change. Sometimes we don't let go because we're, well, we're not sure that what we're doing is wrong or dangerous or hurtful to ourselves or other people or in disobedience to God. Gay groups want to make sure that nobody tells them that they're wrong, that this is a sin. They're even putting pressure on churches now to you know, accept gay ministers, openly gay, openly practicing ministers. There's nobody left to say, this is wrong. So if we can be convinced that the habit is truly a bad one, it, it, it's a motivator to want to break it. Love. Oh, let me say one other little thing about that. This is why parents and family and friends must not compromise with what's right 
when dealing with someone they love who has a bad habit. People say to me, what do I do? My son, he says he's gay, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'll never see him again. And I said, because he thinks he's gay, because he has same sex attraction, doesn't mean that you can't talk to him. Doesn't mean that if he's smart in mathematics, you have to reject his gift in mathematics. You understand what I'm saying? You have to be able to say to your son, this over here, this is unacceptable. This is wrong because God, you know, so on and so forth. You have to be able to continue to say what is wrong. And no, you can't bring your boyfriend home. No, that's wrong. And no, your boyfriend can't sleep over here. And no, I won't attend your gay rally. You want to come over for your mom's birthday? Sure. <laughs> come on over for your mom's birthday. Want to come over for Thanksgiving? We're having Thanksgiving, the family's together. You're coming? Great, come. You're our son, we love you. Thanksgiving's for the family. You're part of the family. Yeah, we don't agree on that particular thing. We think that thing is wrong, but we're not saying that everything is wrong in your life. Just this thing is wrong. But what do people do? Well, you know, they slouch their way into compromise. Well, bring your, okay, you can bring your boyfriend over. You know, we'll try to be nice to him. You know. <laughs> so truth is important. Truth is important. Love is important because love is a great motivator. Sometimes you don't care about the effects of your bad habit on yourself, but you care about how it affects other people. Some people, you know, they give up booze because, not because it's ruining themselves, but because it's, they see the effect that it's having on their wife or their husband or their children. Some quit tobacco because they want to give a, a good example to their children. I, I'm smoking, blah, 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 and down deep inside I know that's wrong, but I don't want my kid to start smoking. I don't want to give him that example, so I'll sacrifice you know, love, I'll sacrifice that habit not because I want to, but because I love my kid and I, you know, for him, I'll do it for him. Still others will begin dealing seriously with common sense diet and exercise when they are encouraged in love to do so. So those who refuse to break bad habits, even with the pleadings of their loved ones, really love their bad habits more than they love their loved ones. And then pain is also a great motivator. Sometimes your bad habit turns around and bites you. <laughs> you get sick because of it. You, you, you hurt somebody because of it. You, you get in trouble because of it. You lose your job, your reputation, your money, your family because of it. Or you just get tired of feeling guilty all the time. Some people, you know, they have to hit bottom like the prodigal son before they start dealing with their problems. I remember one, again, not anyone here, I remember one obese, he was obese, this brother, was shocked into better eating when his scale said to him, you weigh 329 pounds. Because <laughs> he always thought he was like a 200 pound guy. Yeah, I'm 240, I'm 240, you know. I'm a big guy, what do you want? Big guys, we got to eat, you know, I'm 240. Played ball, I'm 240. He kept going around, I'm 240, I'm 240, and he ate like a horse, you know what I'm saying? And what happened? One day he actually got on the scale to see if he was still 40 and he was 329. And the fact that the scale went past the 300, that's the thing that, because lots of people are 220, 215. You know, he figured I'm with those guys. But when the needle went past 300, 300 pounds, and this was not a guy who was like six foot seven, you know, the big, huge man. The guy was shorter than I am. Yeah, what a shock. So people who ignore the pain and they go on are truly ignorant and rebellious in God's eyes and they deserve the condemnation that they're going to get. So, you have to want to, right? You have to want to. Another step to overcome the bad habit, you have to acknowledge it. 
If for whatever reason you are moved to look for a way out, a way to break your bad habit, the next step is to acknowledge it. You know, the hardest thing to do is to acknowledge that we have a bad habit, not just a habit, but a bad one. It's very difficult to admit that you are a wasteful gambler. It's hard to admit. What do you mean I'm a wasteful guy? I like to play a little, I buy a little ticket here, I go to the, you know, I go to the casino, you know, I never, 50 bucks, I bring 50 bucks, that's it. You know? Yeah, so you go waste 50 bucks, because the odds are, you know, what? thousand to one that you win. When you buy your lottery ticket every week, what are the odds? A hundred million to one that you win? I think I call that a waste. You know what, if you're going to gamble, at least go to the horse race. You know? There are only seven horses. <laughs> you know, I mean, shoot. You got one out of seven you can win. You know? Be smart. <laughs> or, hey, to admit, you know what, I just realized I'm impure sexually. Every chance I get to see something a little racy, you know, a commercial, an ad, to click on something, whoa, you, you see that all the time. You're on, if you're on the internet, right, guys? You're on the internet, you're just minding your own business, you're reading the paper. But there's an ad in the paper that says, uh, 50 women who are you know, nearly naked, you know, and you go, wow, like, is that like news? <laughs> Just because it's in the newspaper? No, that's clickbait. That's to get you to go look at something. And hopefully we'll force you to go look at something, not force you, but draw you into, you know, pornography. People, people consume pornography. They don't start with hardcore pornography. They start with little gentle things, clickbait, and they move themselves into but it's very hard to be able to say to oneself, you know what, I, I'm just not pure. Christianity demands that I be holy, and I'm not. I'm sexually impure. It's hard to admit that. Or you lack self-control with food. It's not that I, this fellow, you know, he, said, he used to say, uh, he used to have a, a, a little saying that would excuse his, uh, his uh, indulgences. He'd say, well, you know, everybody knows I have a good fork. Everybody knows I had a good fork, like he's a gourmet. But three plates of spaghetti later, that's not a good fork, that's a shovel. You understand what I'm saying? Why? Because he couldn't say to himself, I have a bad habit. I, I do not control myself when it comes to food. I can't just stop. It's hard to say to yourself, I'm, I'm a gossip. I love to talk about other people to other people. It's hard to admit that. Or that you're critical or you're lazy or you use your bad temper to get your way. It's hard to acknowledge that. It's difficult because you know that when you admit fault, you can no longer participate in it without guilt anymore. You know, going back to the guy who says, I'm, I'm, I'm not pure sexually. The minute you acknowledge that, and I need to be, the minute you acknowledge that, you can't go back to clicking anymore. You can't go back to clicking anymore without guilt, without not even thinking about it, because you've already said, you know what, that's not okay, I need to stop doing that. It's difficult because the moment you admit the bad habit and try to leave it, you must anticipate a life without a habit that you enjoyed. And let's face it, Jesus Himself said, we love our sins. The light came into the world. And what did man do? He, did He come to the light? Jesus said, no, He didn't come to the light. Why? Because He loved the darkness. We love our sins. John 3.19. So, We'd rather defend our sins and keep them than abandon them. So the best way to neutralize the power that a bad habit has over us is to shine the light of truth on it by acknowledging exactly what it is and how it is hurting us. I am careless with my health and body in the way that I eat. I need to be more careful. That's, that's acknowledgement. Next step. 
share the problem with somebody else. You know, we confess our sins to God, but in order to stay away from them, we need help from other people. Sharing our burden with someone else, you know, a spouse, another Christian, a trusted friend or family member, or a counselor, whatever. This creates in us the thing we need to deal with our bad habit. It humbles us. When I tell somebody else that you know, I am struggling with this thing, my wife, she is my, you know, she's my prayer partner, she's my confidant, I tell her. But it's very humbling to acknowledge something nasty about yourself or weak about yourself. It, it humbles us. And in so doing, it prepares our souls for God's blessings. Why? Because God lifts up the humble and He brings down the proud. Too proud to admit your fault? God's not going to help you. You ready to humble yourself and admit your fault? God will raise you up. He won't raise you up. He won't raise you up in pride. He'll raise you up in strength. He'll raise you up in the ability to deal with your whatever you're dealing with. And it also strengthens our bond with people who can encourage and support us through the times that we withdraw from our bad habit. You know, sharing our problem with another cuts it in half, makes it manageable. Number four, finally, let God heal you. Let Him heal you. In the end, only God can heal our wounds and make us whole again. You know, we desire to break the habit, we, we confess it to God and ourselves, we share it with others for support, but only God can remove the ache and the sinful desire that is at the root of evil. Only God can do that. The thought that was in my head many, many years ago when I, I realized, I acknowledged, I cannot continue smoking and be a Christian. I, I can't do both. I got to choose. And funny, the thing, and I still remember it in my mind, the other thing that came into my mind was this, a kind of a, a sentence that said, wow, you're going to let smoking knock you out? <laughs> what a punk you are. <laughs> smoking, this is it? You're giving up Christ for smoking? What a punk you are. Let God heal you. Let God into that place that's going to hurt because when we give up a bad habit, the, the hard part is thinking, I'm never going to have that again or I, I can't do that anymore because we have the habit because we liked it, right? And if I give it up, that means it's going to hurt. There's going to be pain. So how does, how does God help us? How does He heal us? Well, through His word. In Matthew 8, you know, it says, Lord, uh, speak only your word and my servant will be healed. You know the centurion that came to Jesus to heal his servant, his servant? Remember he said, I'm not, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. Just speak the word, he says, my servant will be healed. God's word sheds the light of truth on our bad habits. It guides us into right conduct and living. It, com it comforts our hearts and it convicts our consciences. His word fills the void left by the elimination of the bad habit. If not replaced, if not, you know, if we don't put the word in there, then it'll only be replaced by other bad habits. Depression, anxiety. I always go back to smoking because I really knew about that one. That was a really bad habit that I had. <laughs> and how many people do you know? I gave up smoking, but I gained 60 pounds. Why? Well, you just traded the, the bad habit of smoking for bad eating habits. I remember when I quit smoking, man, I'd sit there with a bucket of ice cream watching TV, you know? Yeah, I'm feeling good. I quit smoking. I've just taken in a thousand calories. <laughs> oh dear. What we do to ourselves. This is why Regular worship, for example, and Bible study, and regular Bible reading, all this stuff leads to a lifestyle that contains less and less bad habits. How else does He heal us? Through the Holy Spirit. 
The Bible calls the Holy Spirit what? The Comforter. Paul tells us that we overcome the sin in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 13. And the Spirit of God works directly with our spirit to strengthen us in dealing with our bad habits. You could say that the Word shows us our faults and the Holy Spirit gives us the strength to do what the Word requires of us. What, uh, what is it again? The fruit of the Holy Spirit? The fruit of the Holy Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. Notice God never says, okay, you need to start developing some self-control. No, He said the gift of the Spirit is self-control. He engineers self-control, true self-control in your heart, in your life. He also heals us through people. If you want to let go bad habits, you need to be with people who are themselves filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to be with people who will confront you with the word. You need to be with people who have overcome the bad habit that you're trying that you're trying to overcome. You need to be with people who will you know, not encourage you in, in the bad habit. Best guy to help you uh, give up smoking is a guy who himself gave up smoking. <laughs> and if you want to give up smoking, stop hanging around with the guy who's still puffing away. You can't get rid of a bad habit in a vacuum. You need to draw close to God so that He can uh, heal you through His word and His spirit and the love of His, love of His people. Well, obviously this lesson you know, is a summarized approach to a serious issue that a lot of people in this very congregation face. And I, I want you to realize that I don't mean to trivialize this particular problem by simply devoting 30 or so minutes to discussing it. I mean, obviously people go for many, many you know, weeks and months into therapy to deal with just e eating issues. And few issues are more complex than how we deal with food in our lives. I mean, it's a necessity and it's all around us. So there's no quick and easy fix, especially if you remember the church. What is it that accompanies everything we do? Well, food. The ladies are getting together to do a little thing and there'll be a snack. Uh, the heart moms are getting together. What are they going to do? They're going to cook and they're going to serve the young women. What? Food. The men are getting together at the building to do some jobs, but first, what will they do? Eat. <laughs> we're having a fellowship after services. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to eat. <laughs> I mean, we are the eatinest church. <laughs> so it's not easy. If you're dealing with food, it's all around you all the time. Let's go to the restaurant. I'll meet you. I'll meet you at Panera Bread. Who can say no? I'll, I'll have the pick too, you know? I'll have just a half of sandwich and I'll have just a cup of soup and I'll have a diet cola and two of those scones over there. <laughs> two of those babies, bring those over, right? I, so I get it, it's, it's impossible. It just surrounds us all the time. People give us, at Christmas, you know how much food the ministers get? People bring us baskets of food and we eat it. <laughs> happily. So you know, I'm not trivializing it. It's, it's, it's a hard thing. But what I've given you are the, the steps to begin the process of change. There are things which are you know, in the reach of every individual and things which require little or no expense or equipment or time. All right, one, one other thing. Bad habits are visible on the outside but their roots are all within within the individual, and the steps that I've given you are changes that you can make to the inner person which will ultimately bear fruit in the outer person. I've only spoken of one bad habit, but whatever your bad habit, the road to healing is always the same. You have to want to overcome it. You need to acknowledge to yourself and others what it really is, 
and you really have what it really is. You need to find help because obviously by yourself you've not been able to handle it. And you must let God heal the source and fill the void left by the habit that you have abandoned. And by the way, I've used that word abandoned. You have to abandon, meaning I'm never going back. Not, well, I'll try for a little while. I'll taper down. Latest studies show, right? Cold turkey. When I quit smoking, just stop. This business, well, I'll smoke 10 today, next week five, and then for a month three, and then, right. Yeah, it's like you're injecting yourself. Abandon, abandon. So please know that to break bad habits, you have to take the first step, but once that is done, your brothers and sisters in Christ are here to help you follow through. God bless you as you deal with all the bad habits that Satan has put in this world. All right, that's the end of our course. Thank you very much for your attention. I will remind the audience that it is 7.59 and 15 seconds. <laughs>